It's Sunday, February 24th, 2013, and this is the Energy Education Podcast. I'm Kevin Hurley. Today, we welcome Dr. Helen Caldicott to the show to discuss an upcoming symposium to be held in New York on the second anniversary of the Fukushima Daiichi Triple Meltdown. Dr. Caldicott joins us via Skype to give us a preview of the symposium and to discuss some of the current issues. Well, I'd like to start by welcoming Dr. Helen Caldicott to the show. Helen, it's an honor. Thank you very much. And of course, as always, Arnie Gunderson. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, hi, Kevin. Hi, Helen. Hi, Arnie. And Maggie Gunderson. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Kevin. It's a joy to join you. All right, let's start with you, Helen. I understand you're still in Australia. Yes, I'm in Australia. I'm leaving uh, at the end of next week um, on the 2nd of March to uh, go to Seattle and then to do some work and uh, give a speech in Los Angeles and some media and then flying on the 10th to New York to get ready for the symposium which starts on the 11th and 12th at the New York Academy of Medicine. This symposium is the medical and ecological consequences of the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. It's being held on March 11th and 12th at the New York Academy of Medicine. Helen, can you tell us just a little bit about this symposium? Yes, I've I've collected a, an extraordinary faculty of people um, from actually all over the world and um, a leading. Uh, physician from Poland who is a specialist in pediatric thyroid disease and that's very important because um, they've been looking at over about 100,000 children in the Fukushima prefecture and found up to 40% of them um, have thyroid abnormalities by ultrasound examination cysts or nodules. Three have been diagnosed with thyroid cancer already and it's only two years since the accident. Um, Seven more are suspected of having cancer. Um, This is very strange because in Chernobyl it took five years for cancer to start um, appearing. So it indicates these children probably got a very large dose of radiation, namely radioactive iodine and probably cesium-137, which goes to the thyroid too. Um, We've got a wonderful evolutionary biologist um, Timothy Mousseau, who's been in the exclusion zones of Fukushima and Chernobyl, much to his, you know, a threat to his own health actually, because they're very radioactive areas. Looking at the birds and the insects and the plants in those areas and finding very marked mutations and abnormalities in these um, species particularly in the birds who are found to have normal, I mean, smaller than normal brains. Many of the male birds are sterile. Uh, They have crooked beaks and and white feathers, um, which indicates mutations um, and strange shapes to their wings and their tails. What we do then in medicine is we always extrapolate from animal data to humans, and that's how we work out if a drug is safe or whatever. So this is a very, very important um, project that uh, Mousseau is doing with his colleagues and will absolutely upset and turn upside down the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, and all the rest of them, their standards on radiation biology. So that's very important. We've got a man, um, Dr. Wozalecki, who has been studying a village near... Chernobyl, people have lived there for centuries and they eat their own food, berries and mushrooms and the like, and their bodies are full of cesium-137, which also escaped in large quantities from Fukushima. And they have a really a high incidence of severe congenital anomalies, Siamese twins, babies born with no brain, and encephaly, um, neural tube defects uh, such as spina bifida, single eyes and the like and his work is really quite it's on the cutting edge and that that those abnormalities 
um, will probably start showing up um, in Fukushima. That's what we predict, and that's why I had him. We've got uh, a wonderful Russian called Alexei Yablokov, who studied, or oh, who put together 5,000 papers from Russia on what's happened in uh, Europe and Russia post Chernobyl, and it's an extraordinary document published by the New York Academy of Sciences. And it shows that probably up to now, or more than a million people have died from Chernobyl. That is never talked about. Helen, you know, the Fairwind site has been getting a lot of um, anecdotal evidence from um, from people all over northern uh, Japan. Um, we just got an email just last week of a of a woman whose two sisters were pregnant, and um, one child was born deformed, and the other two uh, died in. Um, in the womb, they were pregnant on um, uh, during the accident, and they could tell the metallic taste on their tongues and all that kind of stuff. So, mm. um, I just am concerned that the Japanese government isn't uh, properly accounting for that. You know, that, that's the same problem that Yablokov had when he was uh, when he was in um, the Ukraine. Yeah, the Japanese government is really. <laughs> Up to lunch, I would say. Um, it's covering up this accident uh, even worse than the Russian government did. I mean, the Russian government didn't admit there'd been a meltdown for about 10 days and uh, and they didn't start studying the victims for about five years at all um, and denied a lot of um, evidence, medical evidence, about what was happening. But at least they evacuated people almost immediately. The Japanese government has virtually not done that. Uh, children are living now in areas of very high radiation. In fact, Arnie, as you know and you've measured, there are areas of very high radiation in, in Tokyo per se. And people are living within the apartments with radioactive dust and the like. Um, I've been, been to Japan and talked to the people and they're desperate to hear the truth. I mean, even if it's grim, they want to hear the facts about what radiation can do, particularly to their children, who are so incredibly vulnerable. And uh, it's really, it takes my breath away. I've never seen anything so really despicable in my 40, 50 years of, of being a doctor, that people are being ignored in the face of great danger. You know, one of the things that... Um um, that I've discovered when I look at the drawings, the um, um, the accident movies, you see the the plume going down on the ground, um, which didn't happen at Chernobyl. You know, Chernobyl burned upward, and um, of of course, uh, there's dramatic differences. Chernobyl was surrounded by land, and that uh, you know, they they luckily Fukushima was on the water. But at Fukushima, the plume goes down. It's something called building wake effect. So um, I think that the exposures in close, you know, in the in the 20 and 30 and 40 kilometer range, are actually going to be higher than we saw at uh, at Chernobyl, um, and uh, b because of the fact that uh, you know all of the stacks and everything that was designed to get that radioactivity up in the air. Were uh, were destroyed because they had no electricity to run the fans. That's very interesting. Yes. Well, you'll have to listen to my speech. Well, yes. Now Arnie is going to be speaking in the symposium. Uh, first, we're having the former Japanese Prime Minister Naoto Kan opening it, and he was really terribly distressed at the time. He rushed to the Fukushima reactors. I think Tepco was going to evacuate the workers and he said they're not to go because that would have been dreadful and he's going to speak about how how it felt to be prime minister at the time and then Arnie uh, we've got another Japanese man who is a nuclear engineer who's very distressed about the whole thing speaking uh, Dr. Koidi and then Arnie speaking and he's been right in the front lines of discussing this accident and then a wonderful nuclear engineer called David Lockbaum from the Union of Concerned Scientists is speaking as well about how the accident occurred and what it means uh, both to Japan and to the United States. And I think you, Arnie, and David are coordinating your speeches, aren't you? Yes, I, there will be no, uh, no overlap. Um, my focus is going to be on um, 
how this this was a time bomb that uh, was set back in 1970. All of the problems that happened at Fukushima Daiichi were in place on the day that plant started up. So it was an accident waiting to happen. And then I'll talk about the um, uh, the, the radiation releases. Um, Dave, on the other hand, is going to be uh, discussing how uh, all of the reports from the 70s, 80s, 90s uh, all predicted these uh, these issues. So um, uh, I, I think that the two um, technical pieces um, will go well, and of course, then that would feed into the um, you know the evolutionary biologists and the the, the the dose people that we'll talk later. Well, I thought that having the two of you on would not leave me much chance to get a word in, but uh, for a minute, let's go back to you, Helen. Uh, tell me what motivates you to do all of this. You've been working on this issue for quite some time. What drives you? The reason I decided to do this is because I watched the accident and I thought, my God, this is the worst thing that's ever happened, ever. And Arnie verified that, the worst industrial accident ever to have occurred. And it's irreparable. There's, it can't be cleaned up, the radio radiation on the ground um, and the thing is it takes up to five years usually for cancers and leukemias to start appearing post radiation and so often I was interviewed and I'm sure Annie was with, by these journalists who are cocksure of themselves who say well nobody's died and that really got my goat because we don't expect anyone to have died yet you die from radiation within two weeks if you get a huge dose of radiation like being blasted by an atomic bomb. These people didn't get such a high dose and they're eating radioactive food continuously. So I was so frustrated by the media coverage which has now died off and the accident is ongoing. I mean, they're still releasing huge amounts of radiation into the Pacific Ocean and the air and the food's radioactive and the like. So I want to educate the media, national and international media, about radiobiology and how radiation causes cancer and what other abnormalities it causes, damage to the fetus, developing fetus and the like, so they understand why this is so serious and how it damages the very building blocks of life, the genes in the eggs and the sperm, which are passed on generation to generation. So... The accident doesn't just not end, but the ramifications for future generations with a, with a large increase in, in inherited genetic diseases, of which there are over 2,000, will be enormous. And it's not just humans. All plants and animals have genes. And so from a biological perspective, I want people to understand what this really means and then extrapolate back to the reactors in America <clears throat> in particular that are creating vast amounts of radioactive waste, which, you know, you don't even have to have an accident to see these genetic effects through future generations as the radioactive waste leaks and gets into the food supply. Um, that's why, as a physician, a paediatrician, concerned about children's health in particular, who are so radiosensitive in all future generations, I've organised this symposium. Well, you know, Helen, when... Uh I was an expert on Three Mile Island, and I saw my government cover up an accident in the United States that likely was a hundred times less than what happened at Fukushima Daiichi. So when I saw on March 11th that uh, of, of 20, you know, 2011, two years ago, um, that uh, they were calling out for extra batteries and all, I knew a meltdown was in progress on the mm -hmm. very first day, and. Um, I just committed myself that I was not going to let this thing get covered up like Three Mile Island had been and like Chernobyl had been. And the difference, of course, is that this time the, the citizens of the world have the Internet and we can crowdsource information um, despite attempts by government to, uh, to, to stop the flow of information. And, you know, the, your symposium is just one more opportunity to let people know in Japan that they're that the the experiences they're they're feeling, you know the, the the taste the metallic taste on your tongue the the illnesses the uh, bloody noses etc. 
are, are not something that's in your brain. And in fact, these are real physiological issues that your government's not addressing. So I, I'm, I'm glad you're doing it because um, uh, the Japanese have to know that this is not uh, a psychological issue, that these are real physiological issues based on real physiological exposures. Well, you know, that's what the nuclear industry has always done, Arnie. Um, when people get symptoms of, of poisoning from radiation, they say it's psychological and it's just because you're anxious. And, and one doctor even said, who was in charge of, of the medical um, <coughs> record keeping of, of people in Fukushima, he said, well, if you smile, you'll be better and radiation won't hurt you. If you get depressed, it will. I mean, this is obscene stuff. Uh, Bloody noses are because if you get a fairly high dose of radiation, and a lot of children did have bleeding noses, uh, is because it affects the platelets in your um, bone marrow, which cause clotting. And so the platelets aren't numerous enough to cause clotting, so people get bloody noses. It also affects the bowel, the whole uh, gastrointestinal system, so you can feel very nauseated as cells die in the stomach. You can get diarrhea, and that's what's been happening to some people. Um, quite a few people have reported their hair falling out. That also occurs when you get a high dose of radiation <clears throat> because the actively dividing cells of the body are killed by radiation, which are the hair cells, the gut cells, and the blood cells. So to, to t tell people that their symptoms are psychological, I mean... It's like saying to a patient dying of cancer, look, you're just imagining all of this pain. You don't really have secondaries in your bone um, and, or in your brain. You're just imagining it. I mean, this is charlatanism. You know, one of the things that caught my attention um, early on when, uh, <clears throat> when I saw the airplane flying over, the little model airplane, um, the remote control airplane taking pictures, I said to myself, I want to get the air filter for that airplane. Because the air filter would tell us everything. It would tell us, you know, what the what the motor was uh, was sucking in. So Fairwinds and and Safecast put out um, uh, put out the word that we wanted air yeah. filters, which we then sent over to Marco Kaltofen uh, to analyze. And the air filters are loaded with with hot particles, loaded with cesium and many other isotopes as well. Well, if the air filters breathed it in you're sure that, that the kids yeah. running in the streets and the parents um, also breathe it in. Yeah. So, so I'm quite concerned, but I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for SafeCast and for uh, um, Marco Kaltofen for, for doing the analysis to, uh, to look at those air filters. Yes. You know, science has become so complicated these days. E even in my own small area, in paediatric cystic fibrosis, I can't or couldn't keep up with the vast literature associated with that, let alone the whole of paediatrics. And so people are left behind by science and they, they absolutely don't understand the genetic and carcinogenic implications of nuclear power. And uh, it's almost as if the whole world needs to go to medical school for a year to learn about it, you know. We do medicine for six years and then I did postgraduate training for about three years and it takes a long time to learn this stuff but it's simple enough as a doctor to explain to people what radiation means and uh, particularly journalists need to know because the truth is the media is determining the fate of the earth and I always go back to what President Jefferson said, an informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. And if you have a democracy like America that doesn't understand science and medicine in this extremely technolo technological age and you have politicians who are scientifically illiterate, where are you? You're in the hands of the corporations who make lots of money by doing awful things. Helen, were you able to get Marco Kaltofen to speak? Yes, Marco Kaltofen is speaking for 15 minutes to present his important work in measuring those filters and what he's found in Japan, the radioactive elements, and in, uh, and in the United States. So he's speaking. That will be very good. All right. Now let's go to Maggie Gunderson. Maggie, if you could tell us just a bit about the symposium. I know you're looking at the program right now. What is on the agenda? When I look at the whole 
um, symposium on the internet and people can go to the Helen Caldicott Foundation or to uh, the nuclearfreeplanet.org symposium site and so it's nuclearplanet.org slash symposium and, and see exactly what's going to take place at what time. It's an amazing, amazing conference with uh, the whole list of the presenters are there. There's a different parts of the program. Session one is the description and analysis of the accident and then uh, session two is the medical and ecological consequences. Session three which is the following day is the medical consequences of both Chernobyl and and uh, the Fukushima Daiichi crisis as they relate to North America and then finally a closing which goes all into the waste issues you've just done an amazing job of planning this out and and I really encourage I, w I was very touched by your statement that people are left behind by science well this is a way for people to really know the science if they come to New York on March 11th and 12th and uh, please register ahead of time and come to New York and listen to this symposium meet all these experts from around the world and understand the science of radiation and nuclear power plants all right well that's about all of the time we have today thanks Maggie and thank you Dr. Helen Caldicott for coming on the show well, That's that about does it for today's to podcast. Remember you to register early for this symposium uh, at nuclearfreeplanet.org forward slash symposium dot HTML. Bye -bye, Bye, there are only a limited number of tickets. Also, don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You can join our mailing list at www.fairwinds.org. Fairwinds is spelled with an E, F A I R E W I. NDS.org. For Fairwinds Energy Education, I'm Kevin Hurley. Thanks for listening.